welcome to the Two Acre Homestead. Come along with us on our journey from a small suburban homestead lifestyle to our new lifestyle homesteading in the rural countryside of Southern Arizona. We'll share with you our tips, tricks, successes, and failures from both our past suburban lifestyle to our new rural lifestyle, all on the Two Acre Homestead. Welcome to the Two Acre Homestead Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa, and today I'm joined in studio by my fantastic and wonderful husband, Kevin. Welcome back. Thanks. Good to be back. Glad to have you back. Where have you been? Just working hard. Um, there's been a lot, you know, going on. Um working hard secularly for the family. Um, mm-hmm. working on trying to pay the mortgage off you know, sooner, as much as sooner as we can. Mm. And uh, projects galore. Yeah. I. It's really good because we only have the mortgage is our only debt. So we're working really hard to make sure we can get that thing paid off before too long. So. Yep. That's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Yes. Well, today we are talking about an important subject and a subject that we take very seriously here. And that is preparing for, for food shortages. And, um, that is this particular topic. We want to approach this in a faith based, not fear based manner. So, we're not trying to fear monger and say, oh my goodness, you know, the world is coming to an end to go stock up on everything. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what we're talking about because the things that we're going to be discussing, you can be doing at any given time and at any amount um, because it's a protection really. Um, even the Bible says that the wise person sees the calamity and conceals themselves. So when you see that something bad is on the horizon, you you want to take action to make sure that you are okay. So that's what we're talking about today is preparing for food shortages on the homestead. So um, some of the things that we were talking about was stocking up. Um, that's the most logical thing that we can think of, you know, because we hear these grumblings, you know, from farmers and, and warnings from farmers. We even see it here in our area that the cost of everything has gone up. I'm sure it's in you, the listener, I'm sure it's in your area as well too. Um, but then there are just things, uh, that, sometimes you go to the grocery store and you see empty shelves and you kind of scratch your head and you wonder what's going on. Well, we've been hearing from different farmers and different people, um, both, both on the news. Um, we don't watch traditional news, but you know, other news outlets and, um, you know, different farmers that there are these upcoming shortages because they're not able to, bring in as much food so that it can get on the store shelves. So they're anticipating that there's going to be something that's going to happen, whether it's in the fall of 2022 or um, in 2023. So when we were talking about this, we thought stocking up seems to be the most logical thing and stocking up on meat and grain. And when I say grain, I'm talking wheat, oats, um, cornmeal, things like that, those type of grains, because from those basic foods, you can make several different things. So, but meat is probably, if you are, if you are a meat eater, if you're a carnivore, stocking up on meat is probably, I would say it's the most important because it's probably out of your your grocery budget, probably going to be one of the most expensive items. Um, if it, if it isn't already, it's going to be one of the most expensive items. So whether you're stocking up on canned meats 
or meat that you can take home, repackage, put it in the freezer, or this is a good time for you to learn how to can, um, pressure can your meat, and you can put it on your, your shelves in your pantry at that time. So I think those, you know, especially since I'm the cook of the family, <laughs> those are the things that are just the top priority is to make sure you have those particular items. Yeah. And then another area is animal food. And I've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the price of feed. And that's something that we've talked with farmers, like you said, um, getting their input prices of, of, um, animal feed keep going up. I know we've seen that in the last couple of years. Um, you know, because I concentrate on the animal husbandry here in our homestead, um, I've noticed an increase in what the last two years and, um, it's probably hard to talk about prices. You know, we're, t- we're recording this in what July of, uh, 2022, mm-hmm. maybe a couple of years ago, chicken feed, I'm going to say was 14, 15 bucks, something like that. That's not, you know, the, um, organic stuff, but you know, it's gone up 20 plus dollars. So one thing that we've talked about, one thing we've done and if implemented is trying to buy seed, uh, and or grain. So we've been buying um, grain in bulk and uh, I've been uh, experimenting and getting down the um, sprouting of that grain. And what's amazing, it's not just the savings per bag, but it's also the fact that it stretches out longer. Um, we'll go into more detail in the, in the future, but that's definitely something that's been helping us on our homestead. Um, another thing is if you have other animals, um, pets, for example, can you buy, maybe can you make it a goal to, uh, get a year's worth of, uh, of that fee of that, uh, food, dog food, cat food, whatever it is, that type of thing, because you're doing your best to insulate yourself at least for a period of time. And that can definitely help as well. And to that, I would add. Um, especially like for us, we have dogs and I think most homesteaders do. Um, but can you make your own dog food as well? Um, that's something that you may want to look into is, um, being able to make your own dog food out of maybe some of the kitchen scraps out of, you know, some of the things that you're not using, maybe some of the produce, do your research, look it up, find out how to do it, how to do it properly, because, you know, dogs are important. Mm -hmm. I know on our homestead, our dogs are very important and, um, they serve a very important purpose because they not only protect, they, um, you know, they let us know when somebody's here, but, you know, they also protect us. Like for our property, we have, you know, we have snakes and sometimes we get rattlesnakes. Well, our dogs will let us know when something that life threatening is around yep. and they will protect, you know, us, the kids. So, you know, they're, they're very vital to the function of the homestead. And so making sure that those animals, they're not just pets, but they're part of the, I hate to say it, it sounds cliche ish, but they're part of the family. They're part of the homestead. They're a working member of the homestead. And, um, so making sure that you take care of your pets, especially your dogs, when they serve that function, really make sure that you're taking care of them by giving them good food and by taking care of their health, because the vet bills can be very expensive. To go along with that, when we called our meat chickens, uh, recently, we saved some of that for Mm -hmm. dog food, didn't we? We did. Um, Another thing just I was thinking too about uh, rabbits because we're keeping rabbits. Um, You know, one of the things they eat is the, um, let's see, the pellets, right? The rabbit pellets Mm -hmm. you can buy. I do buy that, um, but they don't go through it as quickly as chickens. But we did buy a lot of hay and um, we still, we've kept that dry. So that's been something that's been lasting us. Mm -hmm. We were able to buy quite a bit of that. 
and uh, keep that on hand. And, you know, they don't eat quite as fast as the the, uh, chickens and so on. But that's been something that's been really um, something that we've been able to stretch as far as Mm -hmm. how far that that dollar is going. That's that's been nice. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing, too, when you have animals um, is you really want to. And I guess we're really talking at this point more on the subject of animal husbandry. But, you know, if you have any sort of land, um, you really want to maybe look into rotational grazing, putting your animals to work um, on that particular land so that way they can eat the things that are that are just growing there naturally, the grasses and so forth. So, you know, putting uh, putting your animals on a rotational grazing system will also um, sort of save you in the long run because now your animals are eating what they should be eating naturally, but then at the same time, um, you're you're saving money. So, learning those really good animal husbandry skills. And learning how to feed your animals correctly and learning how to feed them inexpensively as well will really help you when it comes to preparing for your food shortages. Another skill, um, you know, there, there are just some skills that you should start to learn and you should do them on the daily And animal husbandry, like we just talked about, is one of them. But I was also thinking of, you know, creating and sticking to a budget. Because when you are working inside of your budget, it keeps you focused. It keeps you honed in. um, It keeps you from kind of just being willy nilly with your money. You tend to waste more money when you're not in charge of your budget. And then another thing that will help when you're preparing for food shortages is to learn to cook from scratch. This one is very near and dear to my heart. And I guess it's because I love to cook and I am the cook and the chef of the family. (laughs) And Cooking from scratch, when I compare our previous life, when we were going out to eat all the time and we were traveling all the time, there's nothing wrong with those things. And I'm glad that we got a chance to travel and 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 things like that. But we spent a lot of money on going out to eat and going here, going there, and not cooking from scratch. And in in the end, I feel like it did more damage to us financially, and it also did more damage to us health-wise. When you learn to cook from scratch and you're cooking from basic ingredients, you're making an entire meal. There's not only just that mental... Oh, there's, there's, there's a mentality. There's a, there's a sense of pride when you put that dish on the table and you can say, I made this from scratch and this came from our, everything on this, everything in this meal came from our homestead. There is, yeah, there is a sense of pride to that, but there's also a sense of health that goes along with that because you know what all of those ingredients, what, you know, you know, all the ingredients that went in to each meal. You're not relying on the pre-packaged, blah, 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 pre-packaged food with all of the fillers and um, all of the extra ingredients that you don't necessarily need. Things that are going to make it shelf stable, things that are going to, you know, keep it on the shelf forever and, and, you know, dyes and, and, and all this other kind of stuff. No, you know, you've cooked a meal with simple ingredients that you understand what they are. And it tastes much better. We just had a meal tonight with some of the chicken that we, Mm -hmm. um, 
that we processed. And I think we've been talking about that recently. I know for me, it's denser. It tastes better. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I mean, I'll admit it. I don't have the stomach. What is it? The bubbling and so on Mm -hmm. that we used to get because we used to get those pre-made chickens for five dollars from one of those warehouses i won't say their name but you know what i mean and <laughs> one of those there's big a box reason, warehouse stores right yeah, yeah there, there's a reason why they sell it for that right it, so, exactly so they pump it with broth and you know antibiotics and whatever else you know right. but anyway it's it's much better tasting too exactly and it's good for you yeah yeah. yeah, and that meal that we made today was chicken chicken enchiladas mm-hmm. and everything in that meal was from scratch so you know it was very simple and it was very easy and cooking from scratch. It does take time and you know, it takes you, it's going to take you some time to learn how to cook like that. But once you start getting the hang of it, once you start learning how to do that on the daily, then you'll see not only is it better for you budget wise, because now you're not spending money on expensive prepackaged foods, but you're able to buy in bulk those basic ingredients and you can make that food at any given time, whenever it's convenient for you. So learning to cook from scratch is a skill that I think anybody, whether you're male, female, you know, whoever the cook is in the home, cook from scratch. That is a skill that you need on the daily. Mm-hmm. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you looking to build a homestead from the ground up? Or maybe you're looking to build an off-grid dream home, a vacation home, or maybe just a piece of land to call your own. Visit yourcheapland.com to buy rural land in the wide open spaces of southwestern United States. When you visit yourcheapland.com, they're here to help you. And with their help, you can do this. You can take your dream of owning land and make it a reality. Most down payments are only $294, including the document fee. Remember, everyone qualifies for financing at YourCheapLand.com. Head on over to YourCheapLand.com and start making those dreams come true. And now, back to our podcast. Another skill that's good to learn too is learn to fish or hunt. Mm. Um, you know, that's another excellent way that you can um, provide food for your family. So what might be involved there? Well, um, I mean, I can say in Arizona here, you need a license. Um, they've simplified it. Now it's a all-in-one license, hunting and fishing um, yearly. And of course, in your state, it may be different and it's probably electronic like it is here now, um, used to be paper and so on. But, you know, you can even go into probably some, what do you call them, sporting goods stores and whatnot. And you can even ask the person, you can probably still buy it in person, talk to them if that's not something you're used to. Um, Going along with that too, with hunting and fishing, what equipment are you going to need? you know, fishing, there's tackle boxes and lures and all these different things. If that's not something that you're used to do some research, you know, you're going to have to learn how to tie a hook and so on. And, um, so equipment is something that you'll need to do research, talk to the people at those stores, even, um, another thing is when you do go hunting or fishing, um, can you do that with other individuals and other people that, you know, um, and if there is someone that you know, well, can they teach you? Can they teach you how to, how do you, you know, hook a hook? How do you, how do you bait a hook and so on? <laughs> I should say, um, you know, if you're, I don't know, hunting with a bow, how do you use that and so on? So can they teach you? And those are some skills that can really uh, help you as well. 
Um, and then another thing too is learn animal husbandry. Um, we've talked about this, uh, learn how to keep animals, um, the day to day, um, taking care of them, what to look for, um, what to feed them, you know, giving them clean water, even making it easier for yourself. Something that I've done for years is, um, 55 gallon drums, right? You know, have, I have a couple of them that way I don't have to be filling a five gallon water bucket every other day because we have catchment yeah, rain catchment system. So, um, you know, chickens are the gateway uh, animal, right? So not drug, but animal. Uh, those are easy to start with. And actually, they're they're pretty simple. You know, the, the morning chores and the evening chores are pretty simple to take care of. But I do look after them and see, you know, what other things they might need. But uh, they're pretty simple. Even rabbits are simple too, right? So um, I know you help from time to time, but I try to be the one that does it, you know, more often you know, every morning, every night and so on. Um, but yeah, they're and goats are pretty simple as well. Goats just are pretty, yeah. Trim their hooves every, every six months and mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Deworm them. Yep. Yeah. And then I, I would say the other thing too is, um, I guess you can tell where I live. I live in the kitchen. So, In my mind, preparing for food shortages, you really want to learn how to use and store your food on a rotational basis. I recently got a question um, from a listener who sent me an email and she asked me a really interesting question, and that was how to store grain. Um, Because on our homestead, we buy we try to buy at least a year's worth of wheat berry. Now, wheat berries are um, better because they store longer. You can grind them up and then make your own flour whenever you need to. And learning how, and I and I wound up answering her question, but you know, learning how to store your your food long term is a skill in and of itself. Um, I, it really is. And learning how to not just store the food, but rotate it out of your pantry. So a lot of times you will hear people say, you know, put the, put the, um, the, the oldest first. So that way you grab that first and then your newest ones put it in the back of your pantry. So that way you grab that last. You need to be able to rotate your food out. If you have food that is sitting on your shelves and you have not touched that food in a year, you need to start asking yourself, do I know how to use this food? Is this food worth me purchasing again? Because if I haven't used it in a year, then that tells me my family's probably not interested in it. You have to know the dynamics of your family, that being said, because if you're like us, we have a young family, people's taste buds change every three months. You know, what's a hit one month, this month and last month, was it's all about the cucumbers. I mean, if you heard the previous episode, then you know there's a code word for cucumbers and that is poopapoos. Go back, listen to the previous episode and you'll know what I'm talking about. But, you know, that's what the hit is this month. I it, it's just all about cucumbers. But people's taste, they change. And so next month it might be something else. But you got to know the dynamics of your family. And, you know, eventually your family is going to get into a rhythm and a routine. And um, especially if you have a young family, you're going to get into a rhythm and a routine. And you're going to kind of know what people like to eat at what time. And then you'll know what to stock up on. But doing that on a rotational basis is probably the most 
important, one of the most important things that you can do in storing your food correctly. Um, you know, a lot of times people will take food, um, the, the, the lady that I'm referring to who emailed me and she's like, how do you store? The question was really, how do you store rice? And she just left her rice in, in bags. And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Don't leave it in a bag. You know, you want to store your rice in a bucket, you know, cause I think she had like a 50, 250 pound bags of, of rice. And she's like, I just leave it in my, in, in the bags. I'm like, no, 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 don't leave it in the bags. You want to put it in buckets. And, you know, if you're concerned about, um, uh, I can't think of the word for it right now, but you know, any bugs or anything like that, you can get diatomaceous earth that is food grade and you could put a little bit of it in there. Um, you know, but, and if you really want to store it for long term, put it in mylar bags with oxygen absorbers. That's another option, but learn how to store your food well so that way it can last well on the shelf. The other thing um, when it comes to having skills that you want to be able to practice on the, on the daily is grow a garden, <laughs> grow something, whether you're growing in pots on a balcony or you're growing a 3,200 square foot garden like myself grow something, put something in the ground and harvest it. Because when you are growing your own food and harvesting it, it just, you are now putting food on your table at the most inexpensive price that you can find, um, with the exception of free. And if you're saving your own seeds, that's another skill learning how, uh, obtaining seeds and learning how to save your seeds out of your garden. If you're saving your seeds out of your garden, you are practically growing food for free. So by all means, get up, get out there, plant something, make sure what you're planting and what you're growing are things that your family likes to eat. It does you no good to plant a bunch of tomatoes if your family can't stand tomatoes. Plant something that you know your family's going to eat. What if you're already struggling? Identify what you can eliminate in your budget. I know for us, we've done that for years to think about those things. I'm just going to throw out maybe a couple things or so that, you know, come to mind. Um cable, satellite, and or streaming services. You know, it used to be cable, then people were sold on streaming. It was cheaper and so on. Now you need like nine streaming services to keep up with what cable offered. Do you need them? Or can you cut back on them? You know, 10 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month here, whatnot. Those things add up. Are you buying coffee out? That can be something that costs a lot. And some people do it daily. And I think one place in particular encourages you, yeah, and if you come back a second time today, you get a discount. So those are some things to look at. And, you know, if you don't know where you're at, write it down, make a spreadsheet, do something, but see where you're at. Save your receipts for one month, for two months, see where you're at. Where is your spending really going? Um, and then you can make adjustments and you'd be surprised if you cut a couple things here and there that can give you some dollars that you can give another job to, right? So learn to live with less. Now, when I was a bachelor, I had very little. Now I'm sure as a married man, that's not going to fly with you, right? (laughs) <laughs> but if we can remember back when we were younger, when we lived with a lot less, when you just got out of school, um, you're getting out on your own, 
you know, you're getting your first place on your own. You need to adopt that same mentality now. Can you live on less? That can help you to um, probably free up some some things, some resources. Yeah, we're definitely not going back to your old bachelor days. Just as a side note. <laughs> but you're right that, you know, when I know when I was first out on my own, I bought everything used or got things for free. And, you know, <laughs> I might be dating myself with this statement, but I remember, you know, I had a budget of a grocery budget of $60 every two weeks <laughs> when I was living on my own. So yeah, you know, <laughs> times have changed. I'm sure ramen was in there somewhere. <laughs> Actually, no. no, no, I wasn't a big fan of ramen. Okay, no, uh, uh-uh. uh, I've I've always been a from scratch girl. I, I yeah, but anyway, um, we digress. But <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, and that's the other thing I I would add to that. Um, is in all seriousness, is if you're struggling, um, some of the things that you may want to cut out too is like restaurants, going out to eat. Um, you know, don't go out to eat. Just don't cook from scratch, cook from home. If you work outside the home, take your lunch. Um, you know, that's expensive when you are paying for, you know, you're buying a lunch every single day that you're at work that adds up really super quick. So, you know, bring your lunch don't be ashamed. It's not a problem. Bring a lunch, bring a sandwich, bring leftovers. You know, if you've cooked dinner the night before, make a little bit extra. So that way you have some to bring to work with you if you work outside the home. And even if you don't work outside the home, if you work from home, do the same thing, treat it the same way, you know, make a little bit more. So that way you have a few leftovers. And this is where it gets really tricky, in my opinion, because you don't want so many leftovers that you wind up throwing a lot of food away. But you want enough to you want enough to be able to eat. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're not the type of person who likes a lot of leftovers, then don't cook such big meals where there's a lot of leftovers. Be a little bit more frugal with your um with how much food you're doling out. But if you're a person who likes a lot of leftovers, then by all means, if you know you're gonna clean out those leftovers, you're gonna eat them, then by all means go ahead and do it. But again, this goes back to knowing you, your family, your family dynamics, what your family does and does not like, and being frugal about uh, about your food. And then the other thing is, um, if you're struggling, you want to buy and replace only what's necessary and not things based on fashion. So, okay. I, I said fashion <laughs> and I meant it actually. Um, are you talking just clothes or what are you talking about there? Well, if you're struggling financially, it can be all of the above. It can be clothes. It can be based on um, appliances. It can be based on what's the new decor that your house should look like. No, you know, there's, you need to reject all of that because you're not in that place. That is not the season of life that you're in at that point in time. So what you need to do is, you know, like, let's say, for example, you've got a pair of jeans that need to be replaced. Don't go looking for what's the latest and greatest fashion. Look for something that's practical, something that's made well, and something that you know is going to last you a long time. Same thing with, let's just say, um, let's say something as simple as a couch. And there's a reason why I'm choosing a couch, because 
you can say, well, I'm just going to haul off and go to Goodwill or some sort of reused furniture place. I'm going to go, you know, to Joe's reused furniture place and I'm going to get, you know, a reused couch, you know, that was secondhand. Well, dollar for dollar, that might look good to get something that was used. But if that couch is not well made, then you're going to be buying another couch in another year. You might tear it up. Your kids might tear it up. Um, If it's not well made, it might break down because remember, you're buying it used. So it might be better for you to go ahead and buy something brand new. You have to figure out what's right for you. But sometimes buying things used is not necessarily the best option. And that that example can even go with appliances. You know, somebody can go to, you know, Joe's used appliance shop and, you know, get a dishwasher that was previously used. Well, you know, it may it may break down in a couple in a couple of months or in a couple of loads. You know, you've got now you've got to buy another one. You've got we call it the redo. <laughs> you don't want the redo. <laughs> Nobody likes the redo. So Buy quality where you can and don't fall for the, oh, you know, well, our, you know, your house should be the color of the year is purple or, you know, the color of the year is magenta and you need to, to decorate your whole entire house with this color. No, you don't need to do that. That's not important. But what is important is buying something that's quality. So that way you're not doing the redo on your purchases. And the other thing I would say, probably the last thing, because I think this this is going pretty long, and that is um, with everything that you've eliminated in your budget, going circling back to that budgeting, when you eliminate things from your budget, redirect that money, take that money, and use it to stock up on tangible goods that you and your family need. So whether it's canned chicken um, or whether it's, you know, lots of pasta, whatever it is, you know, take that money that you have, you know, eliminated out of your budget. Let's say you got rid of a streaming service that was 20 bucks a month. Well, now you have an additional 20 bucks in your budget. And you could say, you know what, I'm going to use that 20 bucks to buy extra things at the grocery store that I can stock up on. That's how you can prepare for things like the upcoming food shortages and the financial problems that we're seeing coming up in uh, the near future. Sounds like a lot of good tips. I hope it is a lot of good tips for all of us. I think we all need it, right? (laughs) Us included. (laughs) And, you know, reminders from time to time, right? So got to remember why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. What's worked? Do we need to make adjustments? Move forward. Exactly. And remember to do this not out of fear, but out of confidence and out of faith. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's it from all of us here. Hope that you guys found this to be helpful. I know this wasn't necessarily homesteading centric um, on this topic, but we felt like this was something that needed to be discussed because there's a lot of concern that people have when they see some of the things that are coming up, the potential of things that are coming up. So we hope that you and your family are doing well. From all of us to all of you. Stay safe out there. And happy homesteading.